in warm sunshine, the 151 riders having pedaled 1,826 kilometers since leaving Holland, leave Gap today and the Alps behind them. They edge nearer the Pyrenees as they go on towards Valence. Overall, it's Bjorn Aris of Denmark who leads by 40 seconds from Evgeny Berzin, the Russian, and Tony Rominger of Switzerland is third. In eighth place, but four minutes, 38 seconds behind, is Miguel Indurain. Alex Zula, second last year, is only 13th, while Britain's Chris Borman is 34th. Max Chiandri, 98th. The last man overall is two hours and seven minutes behind as we hit the road again. You know, it's not just the riders who have to complete the Tour de France every day. There's also the race followers. There's almost 1,000 journalists report this race. There are the TV crews, the technicians, and indeed the commentators. There's the publicity crews who look after the various sponsors. And in all, more than 3,000 people keep up with this amazing circus. It's always a race against time. That reminds me, if we're going to get those TV pictures to you from the finish, we better get on. See you soon. Well, for stage 11 of the Tour de France, there are six climbs as they turn their back on the Alps, three of them second category. There are two sprints along the way, and overall, it's a distance of 202 kilometers to Valence. And at the first sprint at La Roche des Arnaud, at 11 kilometers covered, Eric Zabel scoring maximum points in that green jersey competition, and again beating Frédéric Moncassin, his only rival, it seems, to that green jersey. Well, finally, the sun has come to the Tour de France and not a cloud in the sky. A possible high this afternoon of 28 degrees Celsius, but still that westerly wind coming into the face of the riders. And, uh, and bad news, I'm afraid, Max Chiandri, who we thought may not start this morning because of a problem with a muscle behind his right knee, has climbed off and abandoned the race on the climb of the Col de Cabra today. So that means that we now only have one rider left in the Tour de France, and that is Chris Bourbon, who still is intent on finishing this race in Paris. On the climb of the Col de Cabra itself, a second category climb coming at 47 kilometers, Richard Varenk led over two teammates, Laurent Brochard, Emmanuel Manuin, over the top, so maximum points again for the rider who's aiming for his third straight King of the Mountains competition. Now a chance to remind you of our competition, which comes next Sunday. Pick the winner, and you could be the recipient of a yellow jersey, and wait for this, a pair of those yellow spectacles, as worn by Evgeny Berzin when he was in the lead in the race, and a race leader's line as well. When you think you know who will win the stage, which is 186 kilometers between Bess and Toul on Sunday, make your selection and phone it to 0891 0. And the leading breakaway, which went on the descent of the Col de Cabra, containing Paolo Savadelli, Rolf Jermann, Tiddy Bourguignon, Roland Brochard, was clear over the top of the Col de Rousseau. And then on the climb of the Col de la Chaux at 125 kilometers, another second category climb, and Brochard just ahead of Rolf Jermann, a small gap. And then over the top came Bourguignon and Savadelli. The main field were led over by the yellow jersey, Bjorn Aris, and they are 1 minute and 20 seconds back. And while we look at these lovely pictures, let me also say a special mention, and we can't say it to everybody, as you'll understand, but on this occasion, Valence School in Kent is racing for the first time ever to Valence in the Tour de France, a special school of 5 to 19 years old for children with special needs. We know you're watching and enjoy the show. And also William Morris, who is 7 years old, he said he's watched the Tour ever since he was born. So enjoy today, William, and a happy birthday to your dad. Well, we're now looking at uh, Marco Fincato, who's in a group of nine riders now who have formed as they started the climb of the third category hill, the Montagna de Malatra. They are still in pursuit now of just two riders. The first two riders who went over the top of the Col de la Show, Brochard and Yermont, are still 55 seconds ahead. Ten riders forming at the back here, and the yellow jersey group of Bjorn Aris has fallen back a little bit, Paul, to 205. But at the moment in that group, it's the whole of the telecom team on the front doing the work, and that's something they're going to have to do over the next 10 stages if they want to take Bjorn Aris to Paris in yellow. And Richard Varenk, uh, you saw the quick uh, flash on the screen there, crevaison, which means he's punctured. He is back in the main field, so there'll be a little bit of concern for the Festina team. Whereas this group here has nobody who will immediately worry the top ten riders in the Tour de France. And for that reason, Paul, uh, they may have made the right move today. I think they've gone just at the right time. There have been some very good attacks today with Rominger having a little go, Zula, and even Richard Virenk, the man who just punctured a few seconds ago. What has happened is there's been a lot of pressure on the race, and it may well be that this group now can get clear, but Rochard and Yeerman are doing a very good ride at the front. 
Well, Lord Rochard has promised to do something in this year's Tour de France. He's been riding extremely well, and there's a little uh, closing of ranks here. The Kelme rider in the green on the left is Kepi Gonzalez. First time Tour de France for him. Tilly Bourguignon at the back here. He was in that leading group of four, and now looks to me as though he's having a little bit of an unhappy ride at the tail of this chasing group of nine. The other riders in this group are Laurent Roux, uh, Marco Fincato we've seen, Stefano Catai, Paolo uh, Savoldelli, he came back from the lead group, Gonzalez, Manuel fernandez Hines, Alberto Eli, Laurent Madouas and Bourguignon at the back. That's the composition of this group and none of them are going to worry the telecom team too much who has six men at the moment driving the front of that peloton and because they're keeping the speed up full, they're stopping men like Miguel Indurain getting back into this race. Well, that's not too much of a problem, I don't think, for Miguel Indurain. What he's doing for the next couple of days is just checking out how Telecom are reacting, just seeing if they can support the weight of the race because that's what they have to do. That's a situation that he's been in for many years now. He knows just exactly what the what the race goes through. But at the back of the group here, Bourguignon, I think, has decided to call it a day. He's been at the head of affairs since that early attack. And also, Paolo Salvadelli as well, he's been dropped by that group. And there in the front are the two leaders. So very shortly, we're going to merge on the climb of Montagne de Malatra. I'm surprised that Brochard attacked. He was in great form. We saw him just two days ago, in fact, launching that attack behind Rolf Sorensen. If he could have just made it up to Sorensen, the two of them together may well have stayed clear. In fact, now he's decided with a black... In fact, he's got a flat tyre at the time, so that was a lucky call for him. But he got a flat tyre just as they were getting caught by this group. And it's a front wheel too, so the team of service car there should get in very quickly. That's a neutral service car, by the way. They always follow the leaders on the road, and they will service anybody in difficulty, and no preference at all. Front wheel change, and he's back in the swing of things. And so if you've got a puncture, I guess that was the time to do it, because he's going to rejoin the group that was about to catch him anyway. This is a look down now at the Telecom boys working well at the front. The second rider is the champion of Germany, Christian Henn, but you can see all the pink sleeve jerseys of Telecom. Three, uh, six, uh, certainly six riders at the front. And then comes the yellow jersey of Bjorn Reese, and not too far away, the green jersey of Eric Zabel. So this team is still uh, not showing any signs of losing its grip on this race. The only full team left in the event now is the MAPE team of Tony Rominger. They've got the power, but I don't know whether they've got the firepower to take on at this race and break them up. Injury a little bit handicapped by his team. It's not as strong as it should be, and the same must be said of the Onsay, because their tour uh, seems to have totally collapsed with the loss of Laurent Jalabert the day before we got down to Gap. Alex Zula, those two falls in the Alps, have pushed him a little bit out of contention as well. Here at the back of the race now, we've got the newcomer, Gonzalez in green, and Mad West looking to get him up there and make him do some work. But I think that well could well could very well be an, an excellent move for Miguel Indurain because of the fact that he's got a weak team. You've got two or three riders in the Tour de France now who believe that they have got a chance of winning. I still think Miguel Indurain can win the Tour de France, but what he'll do is use the other teams to control the race over the next two or three days. Well, we rely heavy. Everybody wants to win the Tour. There's probably four or five riders feel they can win the Tour now. Indurain will do well to just keep out of it for a couple of days, but remember, overall, he's four minutes and 38 seconds down. He will need to get through to Spain, and remember, we go past his front door quite literally on the way to Pamplona. If he's in a position to go to the final time trial, only two minutes behind, then I think he can still win the Tour de France. Right, the riders on the climb of the Montagne du Malatre. After they're over the top of this, this little group of some ten riders will be thinking of the finish. We'll take a break. Bernard Eno could afford to mess about on this 1978 stage. He didn't have to worry about who was going to win it. A stage that never was after the break. Collusion between riders of different teams is supposed to be illegal. There wasn't much the race organisers could do about it in 1978 when the entire peloton decided to strike in protest at multi-stage days and long transfers and got off to walk the last 200 yards to the line at Valence d'Ajon, as you can see here. What you can't see on the video is this well-known activist and TV commentator. It was like a wildfire. You know, one or two guys said, well, let's have a strike, and it went further and further and just escalated. And then guys like Hino got involved, Jan Ras, Jerry Kanateman, and they went to all the, the heads of all the teams out on the road and says, look, we're going to stop the race, 200 metres to go, and walk across the line in protest. It worked, though, didn't it? Well, it did work because the, the following day we actually were, uh, were bussed on to uh, a 
start about 40 kilometers away from where we should have done. And then for the following years, there have been hardly any split stages in the Tour de France. And also, there, there haven't been so many transfers. When all the riders act together, they can be difficult to stop, and not much easier to start, as was demonstrated in 1991, when the peloton ignored the race officials' flag to protest about a rule making helmets compulsory. Usually, though, disruption on the Tour is more likely to be the result of agricultural than industrial action. Like advertisers, demonstrators want an event that can deliver a guaranteed audience. So if the farmers of France are steaming about something, there's a good chance there'll be something steaming in the road on one of the stages. Blocking the race to make a point, though, is one thing. Blowing it up seems to be overstating your case. But that's what the Basque separatists have done on a couple of the tour's Spanish stages, most notably 92, when they picked on three race vehicles, all of which happen to belong to us. And guess where the race goes next week? In fact, the Basque Separatist organisation, ETA, have already written to Jean-Marie Leblanc, the race director, making threats about the stage to Pamplona next Wednesday, which Channel 4 will be covering on a long lens from the top of the customs building on the French border. Now, we'll be there as usual, and let's hope it passes off without incident, because not only does that stage in the Pyrenees look like the hardest of the tour, it also goes through Miguel Indurain's home village. It should be a great day. Let's get back to this one now, though, on the road to Valence. Well, thanks, Gary, but at least those stages still a little bit away from the tour. We've now just come over the top of the final climb today. This is the Col de Limouche, and it comes at 166 kilometres, so a little less than 40 kilometres remaining now. Still the same breakaway. There's nine of them there, and we're just trying to evaluate Paul Show and me just which one of these might take the chance to break clear, Paul, because there's rather a lot of them. The bunch is some three minutes back here. Well, there's a big gap to the main bunch, and it really does look as if the impetus has gone out of the telecom chase. They're not too bothered about the nine men in the lead, and you know, every one of those men, I think, has an equal chance of winning the stage today because none of them are great winners. Probably the most experienced man, though, is Alberto Eli, who's been a professional since 1987 and won a race in every year of that career. And the leaders now just have 25 kilometres remaining in today's 202 kilometre stage. It looks as though they may have read the right mood of the peloton today because the telecom team are keeping all the leaders of the tour entrapped inside it and they're allowing other men to have their moment of glory in this year's Tour de France. I must say, Paul, there haven't been too many opportunities there. There haven't been, but this is a tough kind of racing, you know, over this terrain, and it will be for the next few days as well. This is the same picture we should see all the way down to the Pyrenees. The pink and white jerseys of Deutsches Telekom at the front, supporting the whole weight of the race on their shoulders. Christian N, never afraid to do his share of the work either in this front group. The hands have gone up, uh, I don't think the waving. Oh, they're warning the rise behind because the police are warning here of a car. Now, we've never seen that before. One can only assume but that is a press car that may have broken down. I don't think I've ever seen that before. This is Laurent Brochard. He's the rider that uh, we feel may have the chance to win. He's been riding very well, but remember that Brochard's been spearheading the breakaway uh, since the 40-kilometer point today. By the time he gets down to the finishing line, he will have led this race for 160 kilometers, and that might make him just that little bit too tired for all these riders now waiting for somebody to attack from the back of this group because that's the ideal position to come from and take the group by surprise they're waiting for a sound behind them to let them know that somebody's launched that attack and they're waiting for some kind of reaction from somebody else they're also looking at the other riders in the group to see if anybody's starting to look weak and deciding now which rider they want to follow if it comes down to a sprint because somebody will always leave the sprint out when it comes down to the crunch Gentle rise here. There is, in fact, a little rise up to the line on the contour. It doesn't climb very much, but it's something that the riders will have read last night in bed just to check out the approach to the finishing line because they're given race manuals and on there there are drawings of exactly how the finish is laid out. Those with ambitions of winning the stages will read them very carefully and try and memorise the approach to the line. Well, over the last few days leading up to this, they will have actually been working out the elimination times, which is a, a major problem to a lot of riders in the mountains of the Tour de France. They try and work out every night what kind of time they have to get to the finishing because they know they're not going to finish in the front group with the big leaders of the Tour de France, but they must get through the stage within a certain percentage of the winner's time, and it is very important. And I ended up being pretty good at calculating that. Indeed, in fact, Paul was once eliminated, one of the few riders ever reinstated into the Tour de France, but on that particular occasion, I have to say, he deserved it. By the way, many of you have asked us, uh, via the internet too, that uh, what happened to the elimination time on that short stage we had of only 46 kilometres to Cestrier, because, as you rightly said, a number of riders would have been eliminated had the elimination been applied. But I think the race commissaires took the decision then and there, 
that there would be no elimination that day over such a short distance. But had there been Paul, a lot of riders would have gone. In fact, 57 riders would have been eliminated that stage. Newcomer Kefi Gonzalez goes through for Kelmay. Sitting at the back riding no handy there was Marco Fincato. While his teammate Stefano Catai with the yellow hat on, he goes through. Followed by Laurent Roux. They're all playing close attention now. You see the wheel's gone. Nobody's followed a Laurent Roux through. They've all said, let him go up there. And all of a sudden, the impetus of the line has disappeared because there's nobody left now to take the pace. And so Roux looks over his shoulder, and it's got to be Katai to go through again. Very nervous. You see Laurent Madouas there looking over his shoulder. He knows that he has to start rolling the line through again, but he doesn't want to push too hard because he's waiting for somebody to attack. Brochard just a little while ago was out of the saddle. There they goes it, and it's Alberto Eli. Well, Alberto Eli has gone, but for my money, he's gone very quickly. He's been jumped on immediately by Fincato. Oh dear, our motorbike's gone the wrong side, but never mind. There we can see them down there. Alberto Eli and Fincato, they've got together. Three kilometers to go to the finish, and uh, no immediate reaction here. It's left to Laurent Roux to do the work. There's the teammate at the back of uh, Stefano Katai, he's not going to chase for sure. Well, Laurent Roux knew that he had to close down the gap because this is the most tactical moment when you have to close down straight away when two riders move clear like that, but you notice the Roslotto team have got somebody covering the move, but the other man, Katai, is sitting at the back, so if these three riders then come back together, you can be sure that Katai is the man who will attack over the top. Well, Laurent Roux has got on to the back of Eli and Fincato. And Rue has joined the back wheel of Ellie. Three riders clear. Now as our helicopter pulls back, let's see where the chase is. There they are, and they've hesitated, Paul, and that could be fatal. Well, now's the time when they really have to move because the time is ticking by very quickly over these last couple of kilometres. The three riders now know they've got the split. Their odds are better if it comes down to the sprint with three rather than eight. So they will work together until they get to the Flam Rouge, the red kite, let letting them know that there's only one kilometre left. Well, right now there is two kilometres left. Eli and Fincato and Rue, they have a gap of 100 metres over the rest, but they look as though they're not going as fluidly as they might, although the gap is still there. Well, the gap is still the same. It'd be interesting if we could just get the bike down there to see exactly who is the one who's decided to chase down that gap. You know, there's a big effort being put in at the moment, and I think it's all going to come back together. Now, wait now for the counter-attack to come from Stefano Katai. In fact, that is Brochard going across yep. the gap. You can see the long flowing locks of Laurent Brochard. I see this man's got uh, some, some strength today. Well, he'll try and recuperate just a little bit, look over his shoulder, know that he's got the gap, and then he will try, I think, to go away again as he looks over all the time to see what's going on from behind. Now, Madwas is making the effort to try and bring them back together, and it looks as if Fincato is going to go a second time. Well, they're just about all together again now. The attack has failed. Brochard has gone down the left-hand side. He just got his breath a little bit when he caught that group of three riders, and that could well be a good move. In fact, it's the Roslotto team behind pushing because they know they have two men there. They know the strength of Laurent Brochard. He looks underneath his shoulder there, but he can see the shadow of them coming back up to him. And that's Katai, who's got first across. So both of the Roslotto boys have done everything right so far. It just hasn't, the tactics just have not worked. Brochard, Katai, Eli is the order. Fernandez Ginez has dropped back and opened the door. There's been a big gap again now. And the Kelmay boy is flying up the outside. Is Kepi Gonzalez seeing the Tour de France for the first time. The Tour de France is seeing Valence for the first time. And the Spanish rider has gone clear. Well, I said earlier that Kelmay always get a stage when his poor show is said it usually comes in the mountains. Well, here's a little surprise. The mountains are all behind us now for a while. And a man who is a known climber is going for gold in a sprint. What an amazing Tour de France. Well, he played it just right. He let everybody else do the work. He let Brochard jump across the gap, bring them all back together. He let the two Ross Lotto riders work it out. He sat at the back, waited for the right time to go, and he went straight over the top. And you know, I think he's got it. I think he has. And little Kepi Gonzalez has gone clear. He's in the home straight now. He's just come over that little rise. It's a flat finish. He's gone over to the barriers now. The others have made a big mistake here. The race being led by Katai at the front. But this rider, Kepi Gonzalez for Kelmer, has got the stage win. I'm sure of that now. What a great result for him. He's still got the effort to keep it going up the home straight. This is the difficult left-hand turn into the finish. Now he'll see the banner. He's still got the sprint there. He looks over his shoulder, does just enough. He won't believe this. 
He is going to win today's stage of the Tour de France for Kelme as the sprint starts behind um, Eli Brochard, Fernandez Ginez on the right, and Eli and Fernandez Ginez, but it's too late. He is so delighted, and I'm not surprised. Gonzalez wins the stage. Ginez is second, Alberto Eli is third, and in fourth place, I think, was Marco Fincato. And it was the Ross Lotto team who made the mistake, but they all made a mistake today. Here is the main field, and there's still some two and a half minutes away from the line, and it's still the telecom team setting the pace. The face of the man who triumphs today for Kelme. Now, is he delighted or what? He can't believe it. Now the order has changed at the front as the telecom team have been swept aside, but watch out for that green jersey of Eric Zabel. He'll want to get just a few points today, although it'll be for ninth place only as they make the left turn into the home straight here. The MG team are trying to get Baldato into it, but there's Zabel right in the centre. They've also got the Brasiliat team also at the front as they go into that final bend. And the whole field looks to be coming into the finish now. And Zaba winding it up from four men down here. Well, I wonder if he can clean up. He's had a fairly easy ride. He's splitting his teeth on the far right. He's taking on, I think it's Baldato. But as they come to the line, he's making it very easy indeed. He takes it out from Baldato. And so more points in the bag from all those that matter for Eric Zabel today. So we're out of the mountains. And a Colombian, Kepe Gonzalez, gets the verdict. He wins by a second over Fernandez Ginez and Alberto Eli. Eric Zabel led home the field two minutes 51 seconds later, which also contained Chris Borman, who was well up near the front. The smallest man in the race at barely over five feet stands tall tonight. Kepi Gonzalez did it his way. Overall, there was no change at all after the German telecom team really did control the men who matter in this year's tour. To the cheers of his Danish supporters, Bjorn Arise gets another yellow jersey tonight. It's the most open race for years. Who will win it? Well, here's what some of those in the thick of it think. Big, big Meg. Miguel and Ryan. Bjorn Arise, I hope. Bjorn Arise, bien sûr. As far as I'm concerned, Miguel and Ryan. He must attack. I can wait because I'm, I'm very close to the first riders. But in Ryan, he has nearby four minutes behind. He has to attack. <laughs> Now there's a selection for you, even the riders don't know yet, this really is the most open tour. I think I'll go for Indurain. Then again, Berzian looked good in the Alps, and today Reese looked very strong. Well, just a quick reminder about our competition, pick the winner of Sunday's stage. You could be the recipient of not just a yellow jersey, but also a pair of those yellow sunglasses worn by Evgeny Berzian through the Alps. The number to ring, 0891 11 Personally, I think they suit me. Until tomorrow night at 6.25, goodbye.